Welcome to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to disaster recovery, business continuity, security, COVID, resilience, anything that will help you, your organization, or your community prepare for, respond to, and overcome adverse situations. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, please feel free. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Alex Fullick there, so I'm really easy to find. And I do respond to everything I get. Alternatively, you can find me at alexfullick.com. Uh, longtime listeners and viewers, you'll know that uh, I was speaking at the Business Continuity Institute conference last year, and that my hope was to be able to get some of the people associated with that conference to come on the show and talk about their topics or a different topic. Uh, today is one of those days. I'm lucky enough to have someone back for her third appearance on the show, which is great. On the topic of managing stakeholder communication during cyber crises, I'd like to welcome back Caroline Sabrio. Caroline, sorry, welcome back. Thank you very much, Alex. It's a real pleasure to be here, and it's uh, really nice to, to do this together. Yeah, it, the, the last two shows were great, so I'm really happy that uh, you... Uh, you enjoyed them both to come back for a third time. Very much so. Very um, much so. Just in case somebody didn't listen to one of those first two episodes, could you take a minute and tell us a little bit about yourself? Of course. So I'm Caroline Sepria. I'm the founding partner of CSNA International. We are a risk, crisis, and business continuity management consulting firm operating globally across industry sectors. We've been around for 30 years. Um, we are probably the first to advocate an integrated approach between risk, crisis, and business continuity. And uh, we really focus on crisis anticipation, detection, mitigation, and recovery. So we um, put in place a number of processes. We do a lot of training exercises. We also have developed over the years a number of digital solutions to help clients who already have quite a bit in-house and manage it themselves to actually have access to a number of solutions that help them do what they do better, maybe perhaps more effectively, and generally support them. Okay, well, welcome back. Thank you. Now, as I mentioned, our, the topic today is managing stakeholder communications during a cyber crisis. So one of the first questions I wanna ask you is because some people have different opinions on this, what is a stakeholder? How do you define it? A stakeholder is an individual or a group of people that, as it says, have a stake in the crisis. Um, the closer their impact because of the crisis, the higher the stakes. So if it's a safety uh, issue or, or an accident or an incident and people are hurt, those would always be the number one stakeholders, the number two stakeholders, for instance, would be their families. Uh, so there is a, a, a periphery of, of stakeholders in any crisis. And the challenge is that you don't really know, um, unless you map them, uh, what impact they can have on the actual development of the crisis. So there are stakeholders and they could be bystanders. These bystanders can change over time. They're stakeholders because they're impacted. They're stakeholders because they could be influencers. So it's anybody with, with a stake in the topic or in the issue or the crisis. And it's getting more and more complicated thanks to the internet and social media. So based on what you just said, a stakeholder can be internal to your organization and external to your organization. Absolutely. Yeah, and I always caution organizations, our clients, to try and really take it down to a granular level. I mean, to say this government department isn't good enough. Right. You have to really identify the, the, the players, the decision makers, especially in a crisis, because one individual in that government or that department may have a conflicting agenda with another one. And so unless you identify them um, in, in quite a level of details, you may actually miss out some important clues. Mm -hmm. I know I've been in that situation where uh, a stakeholder hasn't been identified or was identified, but eh, it's only one person in a huge department and somewhere down the road, oh my goodness, <laughs> because they were dealing under different assumptions and expectations causes huge problems. 
And I know we're going to go into later how to identify that and capture all that information. So, so don't give anything away yet. <laughs> um, now let's let's talk about the the crisis. Uh, uh, sorry, the cyber crisis event itself. Why is quick ownership of a cyber event so important? Because the majority of cyber events are not easily fixed. Uh, you may not know where it's coming from, how it's developing, what's impacted, and the tendency to wait in order to give answers is actually the wrong strategy. At the end of the day, it's better to own it up front, know that, you know, tell your critical stakeholders, certainly the early ones that might be impacted, um, that you have a problem, that you're putting in place, that you have a number of actions to try and mitigate the situation. Um, then actually letting it, um, trying to keep it under wrap until you think you have a fix. There's more than one organization that's gotten caught that way. And when it finally comes out, the damage is 10 times worse because those stakeholders whose data has been compromised are outraged and rightly so. So owning up is a safer bet, even if you can't fix it, to at least retain the trust of the stakeholders, which actually are the very raison d'etre of why you operate. Well, who owns uh, an incident like that? Because with some organizations, you have your IT service management team and everything goes through them first and then it's dispersed out to, you know, depending on the issue. But who owns cyber, uh, you know, if there's a cyber crisis, who's in charge of that? I think the word is crisis. If there's a crisis, because it has the hallmark of, uncertainty, potential threat to a number of areas uh, can actually hamper the ability to operate all the, the criteria that make a crisis a crisis, then it's the crisis custodian and the crisis team, whether it's a cyber crisis, a health crisis, or a building that's just collapsed, actually makes no, no difference. So I think having this sort of escalation uh, steps in place that means that if somebody in the IT department or anybody detects something is not quite right, they have the ability to actually alert, notify, and mobilize support all the way up to the top echelon in their organization. Because at the end of the day, in the major cyber um, and ransomware crises we have, and there's, I mean, it's the number is just staggering, but the big ones that make the news, um, the impact was huge. And so decisions have to be made at the top. So ultimately, if it's at a crisis level, it has to be at the top. Well, what would you say to, and, and I'm, I've just seen this yesterday, that mm -hmm. when there's a cyber crisis, a cyber incident, event, whatever word people want to use, all of a sudden, it's a different process. As though the cybersecurity team breaks away, shall we say, from your regular crisis management team structure and it's managed separate. Oh, a cyber event, this is how we do it. And, and it just kind of breaks away. What What are your thoughts on that? What, what do you have to say about those kind of teams? I don't, do quite, I don't quite agree with that. And I think mm -hmm. it comes from um, organizations thinking that this is complicated and therefore only the IT security team can deal with it. But I think there's two aspects to this. There's the actual operational resolution of the cyber problem. And if it has a ransomware component, which most of them do now, the decision is not gonna to pay or not to pay, which may or may not impact the outcome of the crisis, is not necessarily in the hand of the cybersecurity team. It's gonna be in the hands of a higher, with the leadership team. So actually the same formula applies if you've got a product quality, major product quality problem. It's a quality team that's gonna deal with the actual detail of, of the mitigation plan, but the high level decisions still need to be made by the crisis management team at the highest levels of the organization. Because if it's already a crisis, the ramification, the potential impact on stakeholders and hence reputation, trust, um, is, is huge, it's huge. So I think it, it is wrong. I think it comes from a perception by other people in the organization, oh, it's cybersecurity. We don't know anything about it. Let the experts deal with it. Mm. And I think that's a mistake. I agree 100% with that. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to 
knock that into a, a few uh, people's heads right now. It's like, why are you creating a separate <laughs> process? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And in but, fact, I, I can make a parallel with what used to happen in my early career coming out of a comms. I came out of a comms communications consultancy, and that's where I handled my first crises. And in those days, the perception was that, oh, if we had a crisis, you'd take that hot potato and you'd bounce it to the communications team to go and spin it, to go and fix it. In fact, the crisis seldom started with communication. And what we had to do is go back to the crisis management team, hold on a second, what is your strategy in this situation? What is your positioning? What are you going to do? And we can then translate that into communication messages and strategic um, uh, action plans to actually communicate it to the right stakeholders. Mm -hmm. But it's not for communication to fix the problem. Uh, so it, it, there was that perception because in, and in those days, there was a tendency, oh, oh, it's the media. Oh, my God. And of course, now it's social media. So it's even worse. And, and I think there's a tendency to get nervous with this. I think today you see a lot more ownership of the communication process by the crisis leader, by the crisis management team in consultation with the communication expert on the team. And I think the same thing needs to happen. Um, you know, if you, if you assume that ransomware is actually an extortion or a, a form, it is an extortion, it's a form of, of kidnapping or hostage. If it wasn't a ransom, if it was a person that was taken hostage or kidnapped, you wouldn't say, oh, here, here's the kidnapping, deal with it. No, you'd still have to deal with it. And whilst you'd have the expert doing the mediation with the hostage taker. Mm -hmm. So the parallel is there. Uh, yeah. So by all means, cybersecurity teams have the know-how, have the technical details inside mm -hmm. to make, help make the right decisions. And in some cases, organizations don't have such teams. So they uh, call in cybersecurity or forensic um, external um, experts, which is perfectly fine. Um, and, and then that insight is provided to the crisis team to make the po best possible decisions. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've seen in uh, a, a couple of different organizations, when the cyber security team is kind of broken away and they have their own little process, I've always said to them, going, well, you're in a crisis, you're, you're dealing with the, the, uh, the, the cyber incidents and you're looking for things. What's happening on the business side? You've broken away from the crisis management team now. What are they doing? They don't know what's going on. They, they need to activate certain things on their side, uh, but you've broken away from that structure. So how are you communicating? And a lot of times they just, well, we're just following our process. Yeah, yeah, but your process doesn't have business in it. So exactly. what are you doing? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that could mean customers. It could mean suppliers. It could mean anybody that does business internal. I mean, obviously, employees is critical. But anybody that does business with the organization that may be impacted by this. So indeed, the IT security team can work as an advisor to those parties. But the communication and the engagement with those stakeholders, which is a lifeline in terms of support, in, term, in terms of, sorry, trust for the organization, needs to be taken on by the crisis team. Yeah. So my next question then is, why is empathy so important? during a cyber crisis? I think empathy is important in any crisis. The obvious areas where, where or the area, the types of crisis where it's more obvious is where anybody in personally is impacted uh, physically, uh, where you may have injuries or you may have loss, uh, loss of life. So there, the empathy is, is more natural. But in fact, in a cybersecurity, the empathy should also be there because if data is lost, data is compromised, data is sold, even which is the problem. So companies may pay and the data still gets sold. The data mm -hmm. is still compromised. We're talking about quadruple extortion now, not just one or two, one on top of the other. So I think the empathy to put yourself in the shoes of those individuals or organization or say, oh my God, you know, what have I lost? What's compromised? It's going to be mm -hmm. out there. And then what's going to happen to that? What do I have to do personally or as an organization to try and mitigate this? So empathy is critical. You know what, though? 
Empathy comes naturally to some people and other people have to learn it. And the problem is that there is, tends to be a series of packaged statements that are designed to express mm. empathy. And because they're packaged, they don't express any empathy anymore. People have forgotten to say things genuinely empathetically. So if you, if you say to someone, um, you know, if an, if an organization has had a major, for instance, accident, why call it an incident? What does it tell the stakeholder who may have someone in the plan that's lost their life? Mm -hmm. Call it a tragic in accident. It's, you know, whatever, a tragic situation. Call something by its name. And there's a tendency to downplay and use corporate speak. And I think the result is that it, um, it comes across as if it's happening to someone else. And empathy needs to come from the heart. So, you know, the, 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 the cliche sentence of our thoughts are with the people impacted is such a package sentence. And actually I've talked to a lot of people, including the re reporters, reporters hate it. They absolutely hate that phrase. And it's like, there's so many different ways to express empathy genuinely. Um, but it's a hard thing to do for a lot of people. Uh, I, I, as a side note, I think it's sometimes because legal gets involved yes. before something goes out. I know that's a whole conversation in itself. <laughs> yeah, and I think legal and 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 you know the crisis team and the communication those legal should be an integral part of reputation protection. So on the one hand, you protect any liability but you know it's nice to have protected liability but if your reputation is down the tube then mm -hmm. what i mean take the purdue case and the sackler family so there's a massive payout but they're getting off scotch free is anybody going to work with one of, will they ever personally have any ownership of this and will anybody actually absolve them of this absolutely not they've just hung themselves and they've crucified themselves by doing yeah. that Mm -hmm. So why should we pay attention then to what all these stakeholders are thinking and, and um, saying and how they react? Why is okay. it important for us to pay attention to that? So one of the strategic, I would say soft skills, well, strategic crisis leadership skill um, is what we call worst case scenario development. So once you're in the situation, a couple of people on the team should really sit down and think through, okay, this is not good. We know the crises get worse before they get better. How is this gonna get worse? And there are four typical ways that a situation can get worse. One, the fire gets worse. It spreads or it gets more intense. Two, the fire is out, but the impact of the fire actually escalates the situation if after two days, Instead of an injury, you have two, two fatalities. So you now have, you know, basically um, two people that have passed away. The third way that a situation or a crisis get, gets worse, and it's actually more and more frequent, is the power of stakeholders on taking that situation in one direction or in an, another. Uh, and the influence and the pressure that some of these stakeholders will have on how the situation, even if it's seemingly resolved, on how the situation will be taken beyond the immediate emergency of the crisis. Uh, so that's the third way. And the fourth way and a situation can get worse can be caused by complacency on the management team, uh, indecision, slow to respond, slow to make decisions, and that can make worse. So if you think that one of the worst ways and the biggest variable is stakeholder impact, stakeholder pressure, there's a big job for the, uh, for the crisis team to actually start mapping stakeholders early. The mapping of the stakeholders allows the crisis management team to recognize where they can or cannot have any influence. The tendency for crisis team is to play superheroes. But in fact, in a crisis, there are many areas you can't influence in a crisis. What you have to do is monitor, watch to see where things might be going. But if you've mapped your stakeholders, you recognize there's two or three that are really dead set against you, chances that these stakeholders may take action against you is quite high. 
So then the next question is, if you recognize that they can't take action, what action could they take? And if you've anticipated that, is there anything that we can do to prevent or mitigate that? And that's part of the scenario planning process. So it all starts with a detailed stakeholder map that forces the team to consider ramifications, developments that are caused by, by, by high pressure stakeholders, basically, who have an ax to grind. And just to jump on what you said, it, it sounds like you, um, that uh, expression there, the known unknowns, you, should actually be thinking, not just focusing on what you know, but what you don't know and what might happen, right? The the unknowns. Absolutely. And that's also part of what is called situational awareness. So in any given crisis at the beginning, middle, end, you're going to get a bunch of information, misinformation, lots of holes everywhere. It's a big like a piece of Swiss cheese. And somehow you have to make not assumptions, but try to, to imagine what is in what you don't know. And with that assessment, which is called situational awareness, so assessing further risks and threats based on the facts you have, you can actually build strategies. And some of these unknowns could be coming from stakeholders. So the mapping of stakeholders is a vital, vital com competency among crisis teams. And most people think they can just wing it and a mm. list is sufficient. Mapping of stakeholders is not just identification. Identification is just a starting point. I think uh, you're right. A lot of people think they know who their stakeholders are and take it from the perspective of, it's the people we're, we're dealing with, that they're our stakeholders which I think mixes the, it up with shareholders. The people think shareholders, shareholders are stakeholders, but stakeholders, in my view, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is a wider uh, yes. audience, right? Yes, and I think, I think you can have, as a, your, part of your crisis preparedness and issues preparedness, an exhaustive list of all the stakeholders that, that have any sort of interest in your business. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of map them in general terms by saying, well, those are close to us, those are not. If you take that list in any given crisis, it's a good starting point. So then you can pick and choose the ones that are actually active at the beginning of the crisis and then review it regularly to see who else may join the group of active stakeholders and also who else is a stakeholder in this case that is normally not a stakeholder of ours? Mm -hmm. So it's a good idea to have a starting point with a list that most organizations do, but then that's not enough. Uh, because if you say, well, um, this regulator um, is a stakeholder uh, and so-and-so is going to go and talk to them, that's jumping the hoops. If this regulator or this particular part of the regulator has a strong stake in the crisis itself right now, then somebody's going to go out and try and assess what's their position. Do we have elections? Are going to, politicians going to involve or going to influence this? Mm -hmm. And how is this stakeholder, which is supposed to be regulator and neutral, where is that going to go? That is the mapping, those questions being asked. And could they take action? And then if they do, is there anything that we can do to mitigate that? Then you can go and engage with them or not. But the engagement is not an autopilot thing. And it's not just assigning somebody to engage with that stakeholder. So yeah. if you look at a cyber crisis, you know, obviously authorities, the relevant authorities, most countries now have cyber crime um, uh, authorities and, and that, that where you have by law to report a cyber um, incident or, or worse, um, their job is, is they're supposed to be neutral. They're supposed mm -hmm. to be neutral. You still have to understand where they're coming from and who they are. Um, in some cases, regulators are not neutral. And that is, you know, or if you've done a lot of good stuff in peacetime, they're your best friends, but if something happens to you and they don't show up too good, they come to your worst enemy. Um, and a great way to illustrate that is what happened between Boeing and the FAA in the US, 
with um, with a massive, almost you know, beyond normal relationship between the FAA and Boeing. With half of the FAA assessors, inspectors are ex Boeing employees, and a lot of the Boeing employees are ex FAA people. And I mean, Boeing, the FAA should have been the first ones to ground the aircraft. And they didn't, they only did it after everybody else grounded the aircraft. And the fact is the FAA ended up with a new director who cleaned up the act. And actually after that, the CEO of Boeing had to resign. So this is almost an incestuous relationship. So, I mean, that's just a big example. Um, but and regulators one but you've got other people you've got your suppliers you've got your customers customers in a cyber security and employees are probably the number one uh stakeholders or the priority stakeholders because they they're the ones who are going to be affected by trust the most right uh if suppliers can't ship because they don't see the order because your systems are compromised it's not good, but it's not, you know, it's, it can be remedied. Whereas a customer is going to be very nervous if their data is exposed. Yeah. So yeah. the intensity of, of the stake is different. So in a cyber crisis, that's that. And then, of course, then it could get worse. And it depends what type of data, where, how. Um, and I think there's not enough. And, and that's why, I mean, I, I wrote an article on, the, on this subject for the peer security, cybersecurity peer review journal, because I feel that there is too much emphasis on the actual operational fix and not enough on, okay, well, you can't fix it. So what if you can't fix it? You still have a crisis, you still have to deal with it. And what is the number one variable and the one area of damage of a crisis is your stakeholders. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, uh, I, I couldn't help but think it's kind of like getting an injury and focusing on the Band-Aid rather than what caused yes. the injury, right? Yes. On that note, we've come to the end of our first segment. We are talking with Caroline Sapriel today on the topic of managing stakeholder communications during a cyber crisis, and we will be right back. Welcome back. Today, we are talking with Caroline Sapriel on the topic of managing stakeholder communications during a cyber crisis. Caroline, you've kind of touched on this a few times here. So I'm wondering, how do we actually um, identify and map our stakeholders? Yeah, um, actually, it's, it's interesting. This is something that evolved in our firm over the last 20, 30 years, because for a long time, we realized that organizations, I, we didn't think they were doing it or the, the systems they had to so-called map stakeholders wasn't helpful enough to fast track the process in a crisis. In a crisis, you don't have the time to sit there and do research and focus groups and all sorts of things to try and understand what your stakeholders are. You have to um, really fast track the process and the, and, and the fast tracking really rests on a series of questions which we ended up putting in a process. And then a few years ago, we moved that into an actual automated tool called Untangle. The idea was that you untangle the stakeholder maze. And it really is a maze today because it's multiple on multiple levels in multiple locations and multiple interests, all with a wonderful social media platform as a way to express whatever they want to express or put pressure. So the first question is, of course, who they are. And there, like I said earlier, we go down to individuals, groups. And when we talk about, for instance, a main stakeholder, which in a crisis is a stakeholder, whereas in normal time is an influencer, is news media. You can't put news media as a whole because there's multiple types of news media. They have different political agendas, different medium. One is broadcast, one is print, one is more sensationalist, one is more serious. So if you're gonna make a proper stakeholder map for media in a crisis, and the comms team probably would do that, you have to really separate them uh, because it will make a difference with who you tend to spend more time with. So if you know that a quality news organization 
is likely to report on the subject in a more neutral way, you're going to work with them more. And if that entity is, for instance, a newswire, the chances that that news story will be picked up and propagated or shared is quite good. So that's an example, but you have that in different areas. So regulators is another way. Uh, if you talk about customers, it's not all customers in one pot. It could be different customers in different locations or different ways that they might be impacted. So I think you really have to take it down to quite a detailed level. That's the first question. Once you've identified that and made that list, the next step is to actually try to assess what is their issue vis-a-vis -vis the situation. So if a customer is worried, for instance, that their data is compromised, that's their issue, right? A regulator's issue may be uh, that this organization or this company is not following the rules. And that's why they are where they are. Uh, the cyber criminals will have another issue vis-a-vis -vis the situation. So that's the first question. The third question is, or First question, second question. First identify, then first question. Second question is, what is their position? Are they on your side? Are they neutral or are they against you? And if they're neutral, could they shift? And what would make them shift? How do you define that? By well, your uh, relationship that you've already By your relationship, by seeing, by assessing that issue, what is their issue vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the situation? Um, and, and even if they're neutral, because for instance, in normal times they're your employees, um, then obviously the situation may push them in a certain direction. So you need to be able to assess that. Sometimes that's quite obvious to do. Um, if we look at the Ukraine situation right now, a lot of organization are battling two internal camps, the international global camp of employees who want them to pull out, and the domestic in Russia bunch of employees who are concerned that if they pull out, they're going to be left stranded. So that's an example that both employees in normal time would be pretty much on your side. But in this situation, they're actually quite apart. The third, so, so what's their position? And if they're dead set against you, that's when you start to look at if they're dead set against us, is there any action they could take? Could they demonstrate? Could they take legal action? Could they talk to the media? Could they whistleblow? Could they, could they take any action that will cause us more harm than the crisis we're already in? Okay? Mm -hmm. And then based on this, is there anything we can do about it? And if you can't, because you can't always influence everything, then you basically monitor and where you can influence, you decide on the strategy and you engage. Now, the description of the, and then you engage, you create messages, you create an owner and you create an expected result from that engagement. So the description of the steps took me less than five minutes. It's the practice in the system that really, I mean, we have clients who use this approach already for a while and we didn't, 15, 20 minutes, they can they have started mapping and it really helps them. And then they can flag to the rest of the team and say, hey guys, we're gonna have problems from coming from this stakeholder group. So we better watch out. What are we gonna do about it if that happens? Or is there anything we can do to, to prevent or mitigate this? Mm -hmm. So it's part of a really strategic approach. And I think it's very empowering. A crisis team often finds themselves in a reactive. They're reacting to the developments. And what this and worst case scenario planning does is actually empowers the team to do something proactively. And it's good for morale, it's good for strategy, and it also can save the day. <clears throat> what would you say if you're doing this uh, stakeholder mapping, is it possible to uncover groups you didn't even know um, that turn out to be major, um, uh, I almost said shareholders, whoops, major stakeholders that you didn't really know were your yes. stakeholders? 
Is it possible yes. to uncover yes. that, those kind of things? Absolutely. So it is, like we said earlier, it is a good idea to start from an existing list, an exhaustive list of your stakeholders and look at, okay, who's relevant here? And then as you look into the actual situation, you may find that there's other stakeholders that are normally not your stakeholders. And there you may be a little bit more in the dark and you may not be able to really figure out their position. So you're a little bit more uncertain with that. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge. If there's anything you can do to try and assess the position uh, of stakeholders is really the starting point. And yes, the process can allow you to discover that, uncover that, and also uh, shape the strategy based on what you have been able to assess. Is it also possible that when you identify these different uh, stakeholder groups that ones you think you have a fantastic relationship are the ones that could, uh, or maybe are, uh, against you and ones groups that you didn't even know were your stakeholders are in, let's say, support of you. Is it, is it possible to find that kind of switch? Yes. And, and, and a classic example illustration of this is, and I, which I always use, organizations, you know, are, are, if they make an investment in a town and they build a new depot or a new factory, they employ more people, typically the mayor is going to be their best buddy. However, if that location has any form of accident or anything going on, the mayor is going to turn their back, is back because he only cares about his constituents. Mm -hmm. So politicians and officials are the most volatile, volatile of all stakeholders because they will turn based on their self-interest. We often say a politician rises on the back of a crisis, whereas the executive seldom does. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of one. And at the same time, because of the potential political context, uh, you may find other politicians, other officials that come and knock on your door and all of a sudden start supporting you because your stand and what you're doing actually furthers their agenda. Is, is an obvious illustration, but there are others. So I always say, beware with politicians and officials in a crisis, <laughs> very much so. Even when there's not a crisis, beware. <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure. So let, let's talk about, because we've been talking about communications, uh, what modes of communications uh, should we be considering um, using during a cyber crisis? Yeah, and that, that's the challenge because obviously your systems are, impacted so therefore you may not be able to use your normal um, modes of communication uh, very often you know websites are impacted uh, obviously email systems everything else so one of the things that cyber security teams do but in fact any crisis team should do is to have a contingency of communication channels for any crisis because you could be that you have a power cut and you lose, you know, massive blackout, you lose all means of communications. So it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be a cyber. So having a backup for critical things, which obviously comes from conducting business impact analysis, looking at critical systems is part of the things that need to be done before. Um, I believe that there are examples and Hydro Norsk is the good one from Norway. Um, where they actually completely switched to social media channels to communicate with their employees. And they were the first to do so. And it was absolutely fantastic. So they did not lose any trust. They lost money because it cost them money. They did not pay. And they sustained and actually reinforced stakeholder trust. So they then had a backup dark site that they were able to set up very quickly uh, to communicate correct information on different channels. There are other uh, modes of communication um, which fall outside that are not on company servers or are completely different. So I think having a certain amount of resilience and backup is really important. That needs to be defined up front. And then based on that, you kind of pick the mode of communication that fits best with that particular stakeholder. If it's an official and you can't email, well, place a phone call or ask for a personal visit. 
Mm-hmm. Um, if it's the media, obviously you can communicate with the media via, I mean, the media is quite happy with, with WhatsApp even and things like that, assuming that still works. Um, so I think setting that up up front is perfectly fine. Um, and people are, the other thing is, is something very simple, something very basic that a lot of organizations forget have a wallet card with critical phone numbers. Most people don't remember phone numbers because they're stored in their iPhones. That's true. That's so true. I was trying and to so, remember uh, uh, my mother's number the other day and I went, I don't know what the number is because huh? I just usually press a button. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So these are really basic things. But, you know, if if your systems are compromised, they become absolutely critical. So uh, what about the traditional... Um, because there are so many people that still think this having a media spokesperson you know you have a press conference the for lack of a better way of saying it the old way of doing it the old traditional way of doing it is that still viable i think so absolutely i think so i think uh actually the press even though they want to work fast the press really appreciates the face-to-face engagement with you know, assuming it's possible because of geography and you know distance or whatever, mm-hmm. they really appreciate that. They much prefer that to an email exchange or 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 even telephone. Um, so I think it has a place. It has to be managed. And in a cyber crisis where your system may be compromised, they may be your best options. You know, uh, literally calling down. You know. 30 or 40 journalists and bringing them to a room in a hotel and giving them a press conference because your systems don't work or because something else has been disabled that caused your systems not to work. So I very much believe that. And I believe journalists appreciate that. Is it still possible to leverage journalists to help get your message out during your crisis? Because I remember years ago, that was one of the directives that I was told, you know, if you have a a press conference, try and get the media to help get your message out there if, yeah. as you just said, your systems are down. So yeah. is that one way to, is, is that one yeah. of the, the benefits of that? And it comes back to the first, the, our starting point, which is owning up. So owning up needs to also be done with the media. And media, if you establish yourself as the number one chief source of information early on, the media, what do they want? They want, they want the story. <laughs> they want copy. Um, and so if they know they can get some decent quality information, it doesn't have to be everything on a regular basis by a credible spokesperson or a couple of spokespeople, they'll keep coming back to you. Their job is to give you a fair hearing. But if you have handicaps and all sorts of hurdles for them to get the fair hearing, they won't bother. They'll go somewhere else. They go somewhere <laughs> else for the information? Yes, yes, and therefore they may not put your point across. So you do want to work with the media as an as a, a collaborative, a cooperative rather than collaborative, cooperative entity. They need you, you need them. It's a bit of a symbiotic relationship. So you could actually end up with two crises then. <laughs> you have your cyber crises, and if you're not... Uh, using media as a friend, let's say in a positive way, and they're getting their information somewhere else from maybe not so reputable sources, you could have two crises going at the same time, right? Yes, and that's what we call a crisis and a crisis. So it's no longer the crisis about what happened, it's a crisis about how it's handled. Mm. So that brings those two perspectives that are very important is the internal view of the organization managing the crisis, and the external perceptual view, except for these external stakeholders, perception is reality. So if those two perspectives are very far apart, you end up with a crisis and a crisis. And yeah. that's where the danger for reputation meltdown and trust, loss of trust, becomes mm-hmm. the biggest. Well, we only have, uh, what is it, three minutes left. Uh, do you have any final thoughts for a couple of minutes? Anything that maybe we didn't touch on or something you'd like yeah, to Yeah, I, I think I, I think there's an opportunity for senior leadership team to really develop their, their skills and their ability to, to map stakeholders effectively in a crisis. There's not enough done. They tend to down, uh, delegate it to other people. They have to be involved in it. It's, it is a strategic function. It's a strategic skill. It's not that complicated. 
but it needs to be done, yes. And not enough is done about that. And it tends to be more reactive than proactive, unfortunately. That's an interesting point. Because if you've got crisis managers or a business unit uh, director or somebody creating their list of uh, stakeholders, if an executive is involved, they're dealing with different people uh, externally as well. So there's a whole group that they would be able to touch into that others wouldn't know. Exactly. Right? And it could be also ge geography. So when you've got a crisis that spans more than one location, the different teams need to put their stakeholder maps together and share that because there are considerations to be taken. And we always say manage a crisis locally with global support, but some of these interests can be so high that the top, you know, the group team or the headquarters need to know what stakeholders on the ground there are, are need to be considered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we advocate that with every crisis team, it should be a, a critical skill and there should be sharing of stakeholder and alignment wherever possible. Yeah, that's it. That's interesting. You know, I'm glad you, you mentioned that because all of a sudden mm -hmm. I thought, wait a minute, executives aren't down in the weeds like you know, most of us. They're dealing with a completely different audience. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, on that note, we've come to the end of the show. Caroline, thank you so much again for joining us for third time. So uh, something tells me there might be a fourth at, at some point. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your expertise on this, uh, you know, stakeholders and uh, during cyber, <clears throat> excuse me, cyber crisis in incidents or events. Um, I really appreciate uh, some of the new insights and things that you uh, provided us here. Thank you so much, Alex. It's a pleasure as usual. And if anybody's interested, I do have an article that I'm happy to share with anyone um, on uh, managing stakeholders during cyber crisis from the Cyber Peer Security Journal peer review, which actually encapsulates a lot of that and goes a bit more into details and it gives examples of good, bad, and ugly. Hmm. <laughs> So. Yes. Yeah. You sent me that article. Um, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time to uh, touch on some of those, but you still gave us some uh, examples anyway. So, so it still helped out. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, once again, Caroline, I really appreciate it. And everybody watching and listening, stay prepared, everybody. Thank you. Stay prepared. If you like that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave me a message and let me know your thoughts. Of course, don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.